If you take the time and look closely, it's possible to find pockets of nature in even the most urban setting. And if there are people who care about the environment and its benefit to human beings, well, that search becomes a lot easier. This is a story about an underappreciated New England river that was despoiled for almost 200 years and is now being restored to a place worth exploring and celebrating by visitors and residents alike. Explore New England is brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op, REI believes a life outdoors is a life well lived, Geico, see how much you could save on more than just car insurance, and visit newengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism the Southeastern Massachusetts Visitors Bureau, and the City of New Bedford Office of Tourism. A few miles north of downtown New Bedford, Massachusetts, a remarkable story has unfolded. The Buzzards Bay Coalition and its community partners, under the direction of coordinator Sarah Quintal, have transformed a former 19-acre lumber yard on the Akushnet River into a park where the public can come to hike, paddle, birdwatch, or simply escape the urban world for a while. In addition, the Sawmill Park serves to protect and enhance a variety of natural habitats and the native plants and animals that once struggled to survive here. Got through about a year's worth of permitting and then the really fun stuff demolition <laughs> and construction when the big machinery comes out and that's when this place really began to get transformed. I met Sarah at the sawmill, part of the larger and still expanding Akushnet River Reserve, on a warm early October morning. The park was bursting with color, the fields of goldenrod and purple aster providing fuel for monarch butterflies on their southward migration. Our first stop was the park's southern edge, where fresh water from upstream flows into the tidal portion of the Akushnet River. Just downstream from here, it opens up into the New Bedford Harbor, Akushnet River estuary. Um, so at this point, we're still seeing uh, that daily change in water levels just from the tide. It's still, so it's still tidal all the way up here, huh? It really yeah. is. The herring in the spring, they, they migrate up this, up this river all the way from Buzzards Bay and uh, before, was it hard, was it blocked to, to get to the to the upper spawning areas? It absolutely was. Mm -hmm. So there was a dam on this property that those fish that would need to migrate up the river into the freshwater parts of the river in order to lay their eggs, they would hit that dam and they wouldn't be able to go any farther. So this was the dam. It was all walled, like you said, it was all walled. It was in. all concrete wall through here, and so we took out the walls, we took out one of the bridges, we took out the dam, we took down all the buildings except this little one right there. <laughs> and that we put on the back of a flatbed truck, mm -hmm. trucked it over the, the bridge before we took it out, and plopped it right near the front of the site. And that's and where we're standing. Turned it into what it is. <laughs> Dug out a good one to two feet of fill that had been brought in to fill the natural river floodplain that would have been here. We planted some trees, put down some native seed, planted some shrubs, and nature has it, been rebounding ever it, since. It's unbelievable. You, can't, you could never picture a parking lot here. No. Not now. It didn't take long. No. What we did was we restored that natural river floodplain and gave the water somewhere to go, number one, and also gave the water a way to get cleaned because these wetlands act like a sponge. So as that water sinks into the ground, it cleans all of those pollutants that are getting carried. Right, right. It. So it's a natural filter system. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
outdoor exploration and field trips is a, a big part of what we do. Um, outdoor exploration for families, so we'll have programs out here all year long. Even in the winter, we'll have snowshoeing walks and, oh, and, oh, and, and trail hikes. What do you guys see? We have like this like, thing with two legs. One of the things I love about coming out here is how it's beautiful no matter what the season. There's always something different to look at, even in the wintertime. For paddlers, the sawmill property even offers a convenient canoe and kayak launch site that provides access to a shallow pond and upstream portions of the Akushnet River. The pond is also home to panfish ranging from pickerel and bluegill, as well as painted and snapping turtles. As Sarah and I paddled through the mill pond, I thought about the remarkable spawning migration of the river herring and how the young of the year fish were now beginning their journey into the Atlantic. What other species of fish do you find in this, in this part of the river? So a lot of pickerel, um, small mouth bass, large mouth bass, um, striped bass tend to hang out a little bit further down. How far up river can you, can you paddle? Well, it depends on the season and how much water there is in the river. Spring and fall in particular are beautiful times to be out here and you could probably get a good mile or so up the river. A lot of us just take, take nature for granted. You know, I, I just took it for granted that everybody gets to see this and experience nature and it's not the, it's not the case for a, a, a vast amount of people that are just, you know, in a city environment and they just like you said, all they know is a park with some grass and, and maybe a few flowers, but that's not really, you know, a natural experience. When their parents are both working two jobs to put food on the table, which is a lot of the people in the city, a lot of people in this country, they don't get to do those weekend trips. Nope. Uh, they don't get to go much farther than how their bicycle, uh, where their bicycle can take them. But here we literally have thousands of people in walking distance of this site. And so particularly in the summertime, when school's out or on school vacation, this place is loaded with kids riding their bikes here just to come to hang out. And that's amazing that they're able to do that. It's a great thing that you guys have provided here and the community has provided. Mm -hmm. This project means so much to me personally because I'm really helping to make a major difference in my community where my family still lives and with, with all my neighbors. It's, it's incredible being able to transform a property that used to be the blight of the neighborhood and we've really turned it into a jewel. It's, it's amazing. The restoration of the Akushnet sawmill site in the north end of New Bedford is but one part of a bigger effort to clean up the much abused Akushnet River system. Downriver, a coalition of state, city, and federal entities has been working for the past 20 years to remove harmful PCBs from the bottom of New Bedford Harbor. This Herculean effort, now nearing completion, represents the largest Superfund cleanup in history as Ed Anthes Washburn of the New Bedford Port Authority explained on a boat ride starting at the Port Authority headquarters on Fisherman's Wharf. This is uh, some of the EPA dredging that's happening. They're just at the tail end of their dredging project. About 40 different properties on the New Bedford and the Fairhaven side, uh, opening them up to mostly commercial fishing activity, uh, but also recreational marinas, uh, the mooring fields, all that all that good stuff. The top five feet of, of the harbor bottom is where the contamination is. So that goes into what's called a confined aquatic disposal cell. So you can see over here um, where the boom is. Yeah. It's basically uh, a, a hole in the harbor that you dig out and then you put the dirty material in there mm -hmm. uh, and then you cap it with clean material. When you look at phase one, two, three, four, and now five, along with what the EPA has already gotten, you know, the vast majority of the harbor will be uh, cleaner than it's been in a hundred years. Have so you noticed the water quality? Like, can you see, like, visibly see water getting cleaner around the docks? And Absolutely. I mean, so you saw the, the trash skimmer that we installed. So a lot of it's, you know, you know marine debris that, that we're dealing with. But, you know, the, the water quality is much clearer. Um, it, you know, you see way more marine life than, than we did before. 
Some of that very marine life was revealing itself as we spoke, as I couldn't help but notice the huge flocks of gulls that were picking off baitfish being driven to the surface by unseen predators. As an avid fisherman, I knew I'd have to come back and find out what those predators were. The following day, my friend Matt Koenig and I brought my 21-foot skiff from Mattapoisett to New Bedford. After passing through the hurricane barrier and entering the inner harbor, it didn't take us long to find the action I had seen the previous day. Oh, oh there we go. On. Oh, come on. Right. Oh. <laughs> there Oh, I got the, I got the... Okay, I got him after. Oh, oh nice, dude. <laughs> nice, dude. <laughs> New Bedford striper. The fish turned out to be a mix of striped bass and bluefish. Nothing huge, but the special part was catching them amid all those fishing vessels in a busy commercial port. Just a stone's throw from where Matt and I were fishing, Downtown New Bedford waits to welcome visitors with historic sites, shops, and galleries, and an eclectic array of restaurants offering everything from seafood to Mexican. History abounds amid the cobbled streets of New Bedford, and one can visit scenes and buildings straight out of the Herman Melville classic Moby Dick. In fact, the entire downtown area is part of a national park, complete with park rangers who conduct walking tours. Nearby Fort Tabor, marks the start of a bike path that connects to the neighboring towns of Fairhaven and Mattapoisett. And of course, New Bedford is also home to the famous New Bedford Whaling Museum, which is filled with exhibits and artifacts relating to the history of whaling, which at one point made New Bedford the richest city in America. Today, many recreational boaters are discovering New Bedford and the city welcomes them with public moorings that can be rented at $35 to $45 per night, depending on vessel size. Transient boaters can also rent a slip at Pope's Island Marina and hop the complimentary launch into downtown. The restoration of fishways and upstream habitat along the Akushnet River along with the cleanup of New Bedford's inner harbor and a push for improved water treatment, have a big effect on neighboring Buzzards Bay and the creatures that call it home. My friend Matt and I had already witnessed firsthand how the harbor was serving as a nursery for juvenile menhaden and herring, which in turn were providing food for striped bass and bluefish. But outside the harbor, these same baitfish were the target of quite another predator, a fall visitor that provides exciting action for recreational fishermen. Sleek, fast, and powerful, albies are an addictive target among local light tackle anglers and fishing guides, guides such as Corey Petrazic of Plug and Play Charters. Uh, the fishing in New Bedford can be fantastic. It's, uh, you know, you get a lot of stuff inside the harbor in the spring and again in the fall. Uh, the outside harbor can be awesome too. You just, you know, a lot of people drive right by it. And their main focus is to get out to the islands or go elsewhere and they're really driving by fish to find fish. Um, some of the shorelines on both sides, you know, both sides of, of New Bedford Harbor can be good, um, particularly in the spring. In the spring and the fall, yeah, the fishing can be fantastic for, you know, striped bass, bluefish, false albacore, um, occasionally bonito. Believe it or not, I think the state record was taken from the hurricane barrier. Yeah, and I think it still holds. Scup, sea bass, uh, tatog, but I think mainly the sea bass and, and scup are huge, huge in, in, inshore. Uh, you got to get off a little ways uh, in those rock piles and try to find those tatog, but that's a fall thing. But the scup and sea bass, all summer long, I think you, you have a pretty good fishery there for that. 
After leaving Brant Cove Marina and Corey's 23-foot contender, we headed to an area just south of New Bedford Harbor where Corey had encountered Albies in the previous few days. Sure enough, our arrival was greeted by several flocks of seagulls hovering over tightly packed schools of bait fish that were being driven to the surface by hungry predators. Good rip. Nice. nice. Up tight. That's all that was great. This well, is it right gonna, here, baby. That was going to be my last attempt with a zoom, Luke. <laughs> That's a leg in, dude. You get into those birds, you're getting bit. That's a good bait ball at right there. It's funny, they kind of start going and then they stop again. In front of us, right here. Is it core? Yeah, it's core. Yeah. Nice cast. I'm in, I'm in. Nice. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Never seen one jump like that. Tom, that was awesome. <laughs> Well, for me, naturally, these epoxies are nice because they cast well and they do look similar to what the bait is. But uh, for me, I think color's the big thing. If you, you find a color that they're a little bit more apt to eat, then go with it, you know? Yeah, because they're all, they're very visual feeders. Yes, yep, 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 absolutely. Anytime that I find if the water gets real dingy out here, you just, either you don't see them or they're just not up. You know, I just I find it, like you said, they're visual feeders. So if they can't see the bait, they could be feeding down deeper or they're just not up on top. But anytime the water gets kicked up out here, it, it makes it a little tougher to find them. So cleaner water helps. Last week, you know, it seemed like the beginning of the drop. The first three hours of the dropping tide fish really good for them. And now this is a completely different week. You know, we've, you know, we're catching a dropping tide right now. But for me, I think just moving water in general. I like to have some moving water. Mm -hmm. But there are days when on a slack tide, they'll go nutty. Yeah. You know, for 45 minutes, and then they'll get a little tougher when the water starts moving. So every day is different. Yeah, I and mean, that's why they drive you crazy. Yeah, right? yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a nice one right there. Woo! All right! <laughs> oh, yeah. That's awesome. Oh, that's great. I picked up the fishing from my dad, which is what we did growing up, you know, and essentially he was a fly fisherman, so what happened was I drove. I always drove, he was in the front, so I never thought anything of it, you know, after doing it for so many years, I kind of just knew that's what I did, so I kind of enjoyed it and started off taking people slowly and it just snowballed into what it is now. I can remember taking the boat even out here and just going and fishing at, you know, eight, nine years old by ourselves. You know, no one on the boat, just me and my, bet, my buddy Peter. Danny, we both would fish quite a bit together. So what is it about these fish, man? Like, why do we love to chase them so much? <laughs> well, they, we only get them in the fall and they pull like crazy. Yeah, yeah they're great, they're they a lot of fun. They, does it get old for you at all, Never. chasing these nope. things? No, I come back uh, from the island and get on the boat and uh, I look forward to it, it's a change, it's nice. You know, it's something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how long you been doing this for? Ah, uh, jeez, this was what, year, year 22? Really? Yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the pattern? Do you, do you, how do you determine the pattern or how do you like dial it in? Like what's your process? Well, first is naturally find the bait. If you can find the food and there's some bird activity, you'll know there's something in the area and you just kind of wait, you know, and just kind of see how they're feeding, you know, if they're staying up for a while or sometimes you just got to drift and, and hope they come up next to you, kind of like we're doing this morning, you know, kind of moving around and hope they come up, you know. But the big thing for me is naturally getting the bait, the lure into the fish when they're up, you know, that's key. So you got to be accurate. Accurate, yeah, accuracy is huge. Mm -hmm. Corey and I had a blast with the Albies until the current slackened and the fish seemed to disappear. But the fun wasn't over yet. Just outside the marina, we spied a huge swarm of birds. It turned out to be a blitz of schoolies, stripers, and bluefish, along with some Albies mixed in. Just another surprise in a part of New England that's full of them. I say, it might be a blue. A blue. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. that's a good size blue, Tom. You got there a bunch is. of fish today. Here we go. I got the hey, I got the sling. You got the trio. Look at the chunk. Just coughing up whatever it is. Man. Look, what, what is he coughing up there? Ah, uh, looks like stuff. peanut peanut butter. Well, the fall for me is it's kind of the end. I mean, by the, by this time I've done between, you know, you know, 60 trips on my boat before I leave for the island and then when I get back another, you know, probably 40. So it's 200 trips a year. Yeah, we get to fall salvacore and, and that's what people want in the fall and it's a nice change of pace. I'm Captain Corey Betrazic and I run a fishing charter operation on Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. As I had witnessed firsthand during my fishing adventure with Corey, marine life teems in and around New Bedford. But it's important to remember that much of that abundance is affected by what occurs on land and within the local rivers, streams, and creeks that feed into Buzzards Bay. Efforts such as the Akushnet Sawmill Restoration Project and the cleanup of New Bedford Harbor, combined with trash removal and improvements to the area's sewage treatment system, are already making a difference in the health of the marine ecosystem. With the continued support of government agencies, environmental groups, fishermen, and concerned individuals, the future of this urban city with a rich maritime past looks bright indeed.